Hi, it's Dark Centeno, and I want to make sure that everyone can hear me first, because uh, we have in the past had a few issues with sound. So I'm just going to do a quick sound check here internally. Uh, at uh, another computer, and I will be right back on air here in just a sec. Okay, it looks like we have sound, so that's great. We'll get started. Uh, so if you have questions, just go ahead and put those uh, in the chat box, and I'll try to uh, get to the questions at the end. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Uh, make sure your speaker volume is turned up. I have confirmed that the sound is good. And tonight we're going to do something a little different. We're going to focus on... Uh, some very specific topics, meniscus and ACL, rather than covering the broad scheme of things that we normally cover. So can stem cells help patients avoid knee meniscus or ACL surgery? And as always, any references I make to the cultured stem cell procedure refers to uh, uh, an independently owned facility in Grand Cayman that licenses our technology, and we see patients down there that require that more advanced stem cell technology. So let's go over what we'll discuss tonight. Uh, the basics of platelets and stem cells. Uh, who are we? Uh, interventional versus surgical orthopedics. What is a meniscus tear? Uh, why surgery isn't the answer based on the current research? Uh, what are the stem cell injection results? What is an ACL tear? Uh, why surgery has its issues? And what are the stem cell injection results? And then we'll kind of wrap it up after that. So let's just kind of go over the basics of stem cells, platelets, just to get you acquainted with all of that. So everything we do is autologous. That means these are your own cells. So we don't use other cells, we don't use embryonic cells or fetal. Or uh, fetal stem cells or anything like that. Uh, we offer a few different types of procedures. Uh, we use platelets, uh, platelet concentrates and lysates. Uh, those are concentrated platelet-rich plasma, or what we call uh, super-concentrated platelets. Uh, lysates are where we take all the growth factors out. And we use stem cells, same-day uh, procedure stem cells from bone marrow. And also, we have the ability uh, to assess a facility, access a facility where we can use cultured uh, stem cells, where we can grow those cells to bigger numbers to treat more severe uh, patients. So as far as platelets are concerned, we have two different kinds. I'm going to switch to some pointers here. Uh, we've got platelet-rich plasma, uh, which is basically just concentrating platelets. 
we do some very specific things with platelets here that really aren't done elsewhere. And then platelet lysate, which is stripping the whole platelets of their growth factors to enhance repair. So what are different stem cell types? Now switching gears to stem cells. Uh, we've got adult stem cells, which is what we deal with. Those are the stem cells that are in your body. Uh, embryonic stem cells, those obviously come from an embryo. And induced pluripotent stem cells, those are artificially created stem cells in a lab. Uh, the only ones we use are adult stem cells. So an adult stem cell, if I use a very simple definition, is it's an undifferentiated cell that's held in reserve until you need it, and it helps to repair or replace a cell that's dead or worn out. Uh, a stem cell can turn into many different kinds of cells. That's one of the reasons why it's called a stem cell but it can also orchestrate a repair response. So to use a construction site metaphor, platelets are a little bit like espresso shots in that uh, if I went out and bought a bunch of espresso shots to workers at a construction site and gave them to all the workers, the workers would work harder. That's basically what happens when you get a platelet-rich plasma injection is that you're sort of stimulating the local cells to work harder and repair more things. Stem cells, on the other hand, are kind of this weird mix of a general contractor um, who can recruit more subcontractors, and but they can also turn into the bricks and the mortar, so it's a little bit strange. They both act as supervisors of the repair response, but they can also turn into the cells or the bricks that are needed. And we offer two different kinds of stem cell procedures, really one of the few clinics in the world to do this. Uh, everyone else out there is mostly using same-day stem cells, and we've got a very specific way of harvesting and concentrating those cells to get them to much higher concentrations than everyone else who's just using a simple bedside centrifuge. Uh, but we can also use cultured stem cells to be able to make sure that we can get more of those stem cells to the specific spot. So who are we? Um, you've probably seen us in one of these publications. We've been uh, in lots of different ones uh, through the years. So uh, we've been doing this a long time, uh, since about 2005. So we've been doing stem cell procedures longer than anyone else in the U.S. for orthopedic purposes. Uh, the vast majority of doctors that are doing stem cells just started doing this in the last year, some maybe the last two or three years, but uh, our experience with this goes back uh, at least a decade. And we've treated thousands and thousands of stem cell patients uh, since about 2005. And we do lots of different things. Um, we do bioengineering, clinical research, lab research uh, in particular, what's interesting is we have a, a, a huge uh, university-style research lab that really has all the same toys that you would see in your average university stem cell lab. There's not much difference there. Uh, we have an entire clinical research team and a clinical registry, uh, a full-time staff biostatistician. Again, things that you just don't find in your average clinic. And we obviously also treat patients. So if we look at the 30,000 foot view of orthopedics and stem cells, and then I'll uh, focus down from there, really at issue tonight is what we call interventional orthopedics versus surgical orthopedics. And there's a big difference between these two. And surgical orthopedics uh, on this topic, as well as many others, is really not doing so well in the research of this last five to 10 years. Uh, for instance, large studies have shown that near arthroscopy for arthritis or a meniscus tear is no better than a placebo or a fake or a sham surgery, meaning that if you take patients over here and you treat them with uh, meniscus surgery and you take patients over here, 
and you just open them up and take a look and do nothing, they both end up about the same. And ACL surgeries have surprising failure in arthritis rates, and we'll talk about all of that. Because of biologics, orthopedics will become mostly percutaneous. So what do I mean by biologics? I mean mostly, initially, autologous biologics, the patient's own platelet stem cells. Hold on a quick second. I'm going to fix this slide, this slide. That slide had a, a previous narration on it, so let me just make sure there's nothing else like that. Fix that slide there. So uh, because of biologic orthopedics, we've become mostly injection-based. So right now and in the past, we've seen surgery really dominate orthopedic care. Um, and injections have made up a very small piece of orthopedic care. Uh, by this year, we're already seeing changes in that. We're seeing many, many more things being done for orthopedic patients through injection, but surgery still dominates. But I really think by 2030, that's going to flip. We're going to see many more injections using autologous and other biologics to repair tissue and far less surgery than we currently see. So if stem cells allow for needles to do great things, how important is accurate placement? And there are really three levels of accuracy in stem cell injections. Um, one is really just a blind injection. And there's an awful lot of doctors that just do blind injections. Obviously, you know, I've got the little picture of the guy here shooting with the blindfold. Um, you don't want stem cells placed into your knee with someone who has a blindfold on, meaning has no idea kind of where they're going. Then we have low accuracy guided injections, and those low accuracy guided injections are the vast majority of doctors. They use some sort of imaging guidance, ultrasound, fluoroscopy, but they're kind of just shotgunning it. They're putting it sort of somewhere in the area or the vicinity of where it might need to go. And then there's precise guide injections. And this is really the vast minority of doctors doing this kind of work where they're highly trained, highly skilled, and they're placing really with pinpoint accuracy uh, with a, 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 a sharpshooter's rifle the stem cells or the platelets exactly where they need to be. Obviously, we believe in this type of approach, and we don't believe in this type of approach or this type of approach. So here's an example of a precise guided ACL tear injection. And so uh, this is a needle coming in here to a very specific spot. You can see contrast running up the ACL to confirm that we're in the ACL. This procedure can also be done under ultrasound so that we get the stem cells directly in the ACL, not just somewhere around in the knee. So in short, we represent a new medical specialty, interventional orthopedics, and while we do an awful lot with stem cells, we've been doing a lot of stem cell work since 2005. For us, the stem cells are just a tool to be used in interventional orthopedics to try to allow patients to heal with a less invasive injection and to help them avoid more invasive surgery. So everything you'll see here tonight is an injection without surgery. Our focus is that many procedures that were currently being done surgically now will be replaced by injections in the future. So the 10,000 foot view, we started at 30,000, now we're gonna go down a little bit and focus on our topics here. So let's start with just simple things. What is a meniscus tear? What is the meniscus? Um, well, the meniscus is a shock absorber and it helps to provide shock absorption for the cartilage. So forces coming here and here when you walk or run or do things, uh, are absorbed in part by the meniscus tissue. And uh, the meniscus obviously can tear. Now, it's really interesting. Uh, our focus on meniscus tears really started in the 80s when MRIs became common. 
that was really the first time we even had a sense that meniscus tears happened in a lot of people. The only time they were dealt with before then was when there was a huge problem and the knee wouldn't move. And not to belabor the point, but there are lots of different kinds of meniscus tears. I'm not going to get into uh, every small gradation of them, but there are simple horizontal tears. Uh, there are bucket handle tears where part of the meniscus kind of comes apart a bit. Uh, there are displaced tears with and without bone spurs. There are macerated tears where the meniscus is just chewed up. And there are mucoid menisci, which are just um, have turned from a hard, good shock absorber into a spongy mess. And an entire industry has grown up to treat meniscus tears. 700,000 surgeries in the U.S. at approximately approximate cost of about three and a half billion dollars. So this is a big industry. And that's just the surgical cost. That doesn't include things like all the cost of all the hardware and all the secondary care, the physical therapy, uh, the rehabilitation, et cetera, et cetera. If we add all that in, we're probably much closer to five or six billion dollars being spent annually. So why meniscus, meniscus surgery isn't the answer? And depending on how much research you've done, you may or may not have heard this uh, statement before. In fact, what's really interesting is if you go search in the New York Times or any of the big uh, outlets, you will see many different articles being written by science writers showing that uh, or highlighting research that shows that meniscus surgery doesn't work. And yet what's interesting is few of the patients I meet in clinic have seen those articles despite the fact that they're in huge publications. So we'll go over some of those tonight. And I really break it down into three questions that you need to ask yourself if you're considering a meniscus surgery. Is there evidence that this meniscus tear that they just saw in my MRI is causing my pain? Now that's a hard one for people to get their head around. They had knee pain, they went to the doctor, someone did an MRI, it showed that there was a tear in the meniscus, uh, ergo that meniscus tear has to be causing my pain. We'll talk about that. Is there evidence that getting my torn meniscus surgically trimmed, which is generally what happens these days, just so you have a sense of it, less than 5% of meniscus surgeries are repairs. Almost all of them are taking out a piece or a portion of that meniscus. So is there evidence that that's an effective surgery? It's a fair question to ask. And is there evidence that meniscus surgery will make your knee worse in the long run? Also a fair question to ask, because why would you do the surgery if it's going to make you worse in the long run? That makes no sense. So is there evidence that this meniscus tear seen on my MRI is causing my pain? Well, if you're young, the answer is maybe. If you're middle-aged and your 40s or older, the answer is no. And what do I mean by that? that? That surprises patients. Well, in the largest study that we have on this topic to date, this one down here public, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that looked at patients with knee pain and without knee pain, there was no difference in the number of meniscus tears in folks with knee pain versus folks who didn't have knee pain. Hence, if you're middle-aged or older, and if you have knee pain and we pull an MRI and there's a meniscus tear, there's a pretty good chance that meniscus tear has nothing to do with why your knee hurts. Well, why does it hurt? There may be many other things causing your pain, but obviously doing a surgery to try to uh, somehow treat the meniscus tear when that meniscus tear is just as common as gray hair or wrinkles, uh, makes little sense. It's a little bit like saying uh, my face hurts and I took a picture of my face and I have gray hair and wrinkles, hence the gray hair and wrinkles are causing my, my face pain. That, that's really where we are right now in meniscus tears on MRI. Is there evidence that getting a torn meniscus surgically trimmed will be effective? Uh, well, fair question to ask, and the answer is there isn't evidence that getting 
uh, this surgically trend will be effective. And again, remember from before, 95% of all meniscus surgeries are not repairs. No one's going in to repair your meniscus. They're going in to chop out the torn piece. So let's look at the three different studies that have all looked at this issue. So what did these three studies say? Uh, and these are the three studies down here, just for your reference. The first one, arthroscopic knee surgery to clean up the knee is no better than a fake or sham surgery. Again, we take a bunch of patients over here with knee pain. Uh, we go in and they've got arthritis, so we go and clean up, make, make it all look good. But we also take patients over here with knee pain, we do a fake surgery, and at the end, they're the same. Two, arthroscopic knee surgery doesn't help, and I'm sorry, that should say mild, so I'll correct it. That's my error there. Doesn't correct, or that should be middle-aged, sorry. Doesn't help middle-aged patients with meniscus uh, tears and mild to moderate arthritis any better than physical therapy. Now, again, that's a shocker for most patients. Most patients believe that uh, physical therapy is not really going to help them, and it doesn't work for some patients. But the answer is meniscus surgery isn't working any better either. An arthroscopic knee surgery for patients with a degenerative tear and no arthritis doesn't help patients any more than a sham surgery. Uh, Again, same thing as before, this is now focused on the kinds of meniscus tears that are commonly operated. You know, there are really two kinds of meniscus tears that are operated. There are those meniscus tears in young patients and uh, those meniscus tears in, in middle-aged and older patients. Most of them by numbers are actually in these degenerative tears in middle-aged and older patients. Um, so interesting research to say the least. But uh, suffice it to say that the re these three studies punch a hole in about 90 or 80 percent of all knee surgeries that are done uh, for arthritis or meniscus tears. Well, is there any evidence that meniscus surgery will make my knee worse in the long run? Absolutely. So we have all those research studies showing that it doesn't really help that much. And we also now have a research study that was just published in December at the RSNA annual meeting that shows that 81% of patients who had meniscus surgery developed arthritis within one year after the procedure. And in this particular group that they followed of 354 patients, 31 of 31, 100%, of the meniscus surgery patients are the ones that got the arthritis. No one else in this group they followed got arthritis over that year. So if that doesn't show us that meniscus surgery is leading to osteoarthritis, I'm not sure what does. And, and, and actually the first study on this topic wasn't last year. It was actually in the 1940s. So uh, a British surgeon in the 1940s was the first to publish on the concept that his meniscus surgery patients were getting osteoarthritis. Now, granted, that was a more severe procedure that they performed in the 40s, but this is just from a couple months ago. So what are the stem cell procedure results if you decide to go that direction? Um, patients generally like patient stories, so I always include them with data. This is a, a a young girl who uh, was a basketball superstar who we were able to help with her meniscus tear. Her father was a physical therapist, so he knew that she, uh, that meniscus surgery was an issue. So he brought her in and we were able to help her, again, just through an injection of her own stem cells without having to perform any surgery. As far as data is concerned, this is uh, almost 300 patients collected from 14 of our clinics across the country. Um, and this is percentage change of improvement. What I've done here is a little unique, is I've put pain uh, 
function and percentage improvement rating, that's zero through 100 percent improvement on the same graph with the same time points and normalize them. And this is time as it goes on. So you see here one month, three months, six months, 12 months after, 18 months after, um, again, all with really nice uh, results. Now this is registry data, so this is not a randomized controlled trial, and it's important to note that, although we have a randomized controlled trial ongoing. So let's now switch to ACLs, because these two frequently get injured uh, in tandem. So the ACL is a major stabilizing ligament in the knee. It kind of is buried deep in the middle of the knee, and it prevents front and back motion of the tibia, on the femur, so it prevents that tibia from coming forward on the femur. So let's look at why ACL surgery has its issues. One of the biggest issues that people don't recognize in ACL surgery is that the position of the ACL in its natural state is around at this 45 degree angle that I'm drawing down here. And that's really a very nice place to prevent forward motion of the tibia on the femur. Now, if we look here at the position that you have to place an ACL graft in, it goes in at a much steeper angle than the one I just showed you. So it's really no longer in a position to ideally prevent the tibia from moving forward. And in fact, over time, it's very common to get graft shear uh, or basically uh, notice an area where the ACL graft starts to fail because of that. So again, when you're getting an ACL put in surgically, just recognize that you're not necessarily getting anything like the original equipment. So let's go to the three questions that I would ask if I was to get this surgery. Will getting my ACL fixed prevent arthritis? Will this surgery uh, allow me to get back to sports quicker, which is a really common one? Those are probably the two most common concerns of patients that are looking at this surgery. And will my knee be the same post-surgery? Because we all have in this, this thing in our head that I'm just going to go in and get a part replaced and my knee will be exactly like it was, or even better, almost like changing a tire, right? You just go in, your tire's worn out, you get a new one put on, your car drives better. So will my knee be, be even better, or at least the same after this surgery? Well, will getting my ACL fix prevent arthritis? No. In fact, in a, in a recent study uh, that was published at a sports medicine conference, about two-thirds of teens with ACL surgery had arthritis by age 30. Now, these are the folks who we would think that would be the least likely to get arthritis because they have the biggest healing potential, certainly much better healing potential than I do uh, sitting here in my 50s. Uh, so the answer is no, it doesn't prevent arthritis at all. Uh, so that's a very important study. Will this surgery help me get back to sports quicker? And the answer is not so much, meaning that uh, in this recent study that was performed, they looked at patients, 100 patients who had the surgery, I think it was 43 patients, who opted not to get the surgery, and they both had about the same return to sports uh, between the two groups. Now, you can make the argument that maybe it'll help younger, really active patients get back to sports quicker. That could be the case, uh, and there might be some research that eventually shows that, but this really well-done study didn't necessarily show that. And at the end of the day, if they're going to get arthritis anyway, why are we getting them back to, to sports so much quicker? And will my knee ever be, a, be the same after surgery? And the answer to this one is clearly no. These are only three studies I included down here. There's actually about 15 or 20 of these. Um, but uh, ACL surgery patients have deficits in uh, position sense. Uh, they have muscle atrophy and an inability to land normally. So what are the ACL stem cell injection results? 
Uh, again, I always like to start with patient stories. This is a college football player who we helped. He had bilateral, eventually had bilateral knee ACL uh, injuries. He's allowed us to use uh, his name and did obviously very well with this type of procedure. This is an example of what we saw when we saw his ACL. Uh, more normal ACLs look like this one, the post-op picture here, uh, or the post-injection picture. The pre-injection picture has an ACL that's waving back and forth. That's a stretched out, torn ACL. So you can get an idea of the, the, the transformation in his ACL over that uh, time period after the injection. These are some different cases. Uh, this is an ACL where there's really not much there. Um, you can see kind of some scattered tissue, which is this dark stuff. All this light stuff in here is, is just torn tissue. And then you can see over time this ACL returning to a more normal dark appearance in here. This is an ACL that had a blunt tear, so we have two ends here, this end and this end, and they don't meet. And you can see here uh, a nice continuous ACL after a very, very precise injection. And we actually have a study where we've object objectified these changes using uh, a computerized pixel analysis uh, that is in pre-publication right now. So let's wrap it all up, and then I'll take questions, because I, I find that people probably learn the most during the question and answer session. Um, to learn more, you might want to spend some time watching our videos. We have videos on these specific topics, and you know, I really work hard on storyboarding these, and we have a great animator who works hard on trying to, to, to take very complex issues and boil them down to a simple, easy-to-watch two minutes. Uh, you might consider reading our book because we've got a very different focus, what we call Orthopedics 2.0. Our focus is really specific to uh, regenerative medicine, but also a whole body approach to how we view uh, the body in, in this regard. Um, and actually, they just told me the other day we're now up to 40,000 downloads. Uh, so this is uh, being read a lot. Um, we probably now have about 15,000 copies in print. You might consider our lab-engineered stem cell support supplement. This was based on a year of lab research. So rather than like other, unlike most folks that, that offer supplements who just kind of read some articles and say, well, put this, this, and this in the supplement and, and slap a label on it, um, we spent a year of lab research at our expense trying to find uh, ingredients that in the lab help to support stem cells uh, do certain things. So uh, this was a very big project that we undertook. Uh, we have a provider network, uh, and so we have providers all over the U.S. Uh, who we've taught how to do these procedures. So it's not just here in Colorado. And we're very selective about who we take into our provider network. Uh, when I looked at it a couple months ago, the acceptance rate was 2.3% of doctors that were interested that we ultimately accepted into our network, and that's because we want these doctors to have a very specific core skill set. We also have a knee ACL stem cell study. If you have a knee ACL tear and uh, this is something you can't afford to get done, recognize that there is a no-cost study out there. You have to meet certain inclusion criteria. It is a crossover design, so that means that you get randomized to either getting the treatment or waiting and being monitored. But if you do get randomized to not having the treatment, you will eventually be offered the treatment. So that's the, uh, that's the value of a, uh, a randomized crossover design for patients. Uh, it's much more patient-friendly than a placebo design. So this is the phone number to call. Um, if you're at all interested in that study, obviously you may have already be, been in contact with us through the website. So uh, in conclusion, this isn't magic stem cells. I can't offer you magic. I can tell you and give you some information about uh, what we see work. 
This is precise interventional orthopedics. It's not just kind of magic stem cells injected somewhere in the vicinity of where they uh, maybe need to be. We've been doing this a very long time, and we have an awful lot of information we've collected. We spend a lot of time, energy, and money on stacking the deck in our patients' favor, and we really have more treatment options than anyone else out there. So let me take some questions here. Uh, yeah. Get rid of that for a second. Hold on. Second here. So Faith uh, has asked a question from a surgical perspective. There's a six to nine month recovery time. You know, Faith, in general, the recovery time, and I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about an ACL because that's more consistent with an ACL uh, recovery. Uh, in general, the recovery time for this uh, procedure is about half of that. Um, so a much quicker recovery. Kathy, can this procedure help a person who has an ACL meniscus tear coupled with severe degenerative arthritis with cartilage loss, age 62? Um, yes, Kathy, this kind of procedure can help that. That's not what we focused on tonight. That's more degenerative arthritis. Um, and so that's a, a different, uh, different thing uh, entirely. Uh, G. Mitchell has said, I've had two meniscus surgeries uh, now, and I'm left with little meniscus. Can this treatment uh, help? Uh, I have very little arthritis. Um, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mitchell, that's, that's generally the, the most common type of patient that we would treat. Um, having said that, just recognize that the two prior surgeries may be a little bit of a headwind that they removed so much meniscus. Um, and a lot will depend on uh, your exam and how things are working at this point. Um, as far as uh, Greg's question is concerned, Greg Halick, uh, stem cells and osteoarthritis and surgery in the past, uh, usually not an issue. Uh, the vast majority of our patients have had surgery in the past. Um, Kathy, can this procedure help with an arthritic knee um, yes, uh, we treat an awful lot of arthritic knees. In fact, that's probably the most common thing we treat. Um, Tim, I used to compete in triathlons and experience a tear in my meniscus. 100% will ever compete again with this procedure. You know, Tim, I'd have to take a look at what's going on with your meniscus. So I'm not quite sure I can make that call just by a one-sentence question. But I can tell you that we do have patients going back to sports. And whether or not you'll ever compete in a triathlon, that's probably not something any physician would, would tell you for sure, uh, but happy to take a look. Um, G. Mitchell, if you've had uh, Synvisc or gel, knee gel injections, can you do this type of procedure? And the answer is yes. Uh, that's usually not an issue. Uh, however, be careful of steroid injections in the knee. Uh, they are really bad for knee cartilage and other tissues. So that's not something I think that uh, that's certainly something we would wait on if you had some steroid placed in there. But knee gel injections are um, not a big issue. Um, Paul, um, yes, we treat a lot of osteoarthritis in the hip. Uh, different lecture, um, but that is something uh, that we treat a lot of. Kathy. Uh, Cost is really determined by what we do and how much we do, um, and uh, insurance will not cover this type of uh, procedure. These procedures are, are too new, so uh, that's not something uh, we expect to see uh, anytime in, in the near future for these kinds of procedures, but certainly with the amount of research being done, that may happen in the future. Uh, G. Mitchell, will this work on an arthritic toe? Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Mitchell, we have treated toes before. It really depends on how 
uh, stiff and solid they are, if they're completely solid, which is called hallux rigidus, meaning that the, the toe won't move at all, this is something that's less likely to help. If there's still, still reasonably good movement in the toe, this is more likely to help. Um, if the treatment for meniscus tear is permanent, um, yes, Mark, that's generally what we see in folks that just have meniscus tears, and that's the only thing going on in the knee, um, but certainly uh, not for every patient. Uh, Paul, um, we do have other webinars on uh, hip osteoarthritis treatment, and uh, that's something that's certainly part of the, the bigger general um, webinar. But for this particular uh, webinar, we decided to focus on meniscus and ACL. Uh, it was a little unusual step for us. We usually do give the bigger uh, lecture, but we we're interested uh, to see how many patients would be interested in a more focused discussion. So, Kathy, uh, do we know the long-term results for arthritis? Yeah, Kathy, our arthritis data for same-day stem cells is out about four years right now. If you go on the website under results or under uh, research, you'll see uh, there's a bunch of outcome uh, questionnaires there. In fact, I can probably show you that. So if you go, uh, Kathy, to our website and uh, go under research, uh, there's actually published research, which is here. Then there's procedure outcome and safety data. If you go under that and scroll down, there's all this dis different information. Uh, there's hip outcome data down here. There's knee arthritis outcome data here. The meniscus is here, shoulder, hand, foot, back, and safety. So uh, if we look at the, the knee arthritis data, uh, we have that out to four years. Um, so these are the four-year results right here, so that's how you would find them. Um, is this uh, uh, available online? Yes, we intend to make this one available online. Uh, G. Mitchell, do you suggest doing both knees at the same time? You know, we have very specific dosing guidelines, so our focus, we're very focused on research, and our research shows that for knees, we have to hit a certain number per knee, and uh, if we have more than that number, which really depends on your age, the likelihood that we'll get there, we will treat both knees at the same time. If we have less than that number, then we'll make the decision not to do that. Uh, Doris, after four years, what are the options? Um, Doris, you may want to look at the information, but basically uh, we still have patients that are getting relief at four years. If for some reason your knee is the kind of knee, and we have those as well, that this lasts a couple years, two or three years, then we usually retreat. Uh, Paul, oh, uh, thank you, Paul, for for. Uh, making a comment about the information uh, in the book. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of information in there. G. Mitchell, what medical records do you need to determine if I'm a candidate? Uh, Mr. Mitchell, that's something that uh, staff can discuss with you. Basically, they'll want to get a copy of your most recent MRI. Uh, they'll want uh, any medical records regarding surgeries. And also, they'll have you fill out a fairly intense questionnaire about lots of different things uh, that will help us determine candidacy based on the data that we've collected. Okay, guys, I'll take just a few more questions here. Um, Julie, I had an OATS procedure on my knee 10 years ago, and now I have bone on bone. I believe it's three millimeters. Will in injection help regrow cartilage? No, Julie, uh, no stem cell procedure will help regrow cartilage when there's bone on bone and no cartilage. Um, so that's not how these procedures work. Having said that, do they work well in patients with severe arthritis? They do, uh, but that's not how they work. Um, 
So just so you have a good sense of it. Now, if there's a smaller hole in the cartilage, we have seen reasonable evidence of repair in that situation. But if there's absolutely no cartilage, then that ship has regrettably sailed. Um, so, Greg, can you measure increased space in the knee joints post-treatment? Uh, Greg, we have seen increases in size of the meniscus with the cultured treatment in some patients, which is actually consistent with some recent published data on stem cells in a vial. So we've seen those same types of things. Um, can the meniscus regrow with the procedure? Yeah, Tim, if you have no meniscus, this procedure is not going to regrow you a meniscus. Uh, that's not, not generally how this procedure works. Okay, guys, so I am going to um, close it off here. I really appreciate you spending the time tonight to be here. I'm going to go home and have some dinner with my family. So thank you so much, and, and we will record this one and have this one available online for everyone. If you have any other questions that are burning that you didn't get answered, uh, staff can usually help you with those. If they can't help you with those, then they'll go ahead and get those questions to me. So thank you so much for spending time tonight.